as old as civilization itself, our search for mastery over the wind and the waves has taken us to areas of discovery that were once unimaginable. As we seek to understand and control the forces of nature that can power us through the water on a journey that has only just begun. Since man first got on the water and realized that you can only get so far by rowing, sailing has opened up new boundaries. Well, I think boats will ultimately just keep going a little bit faster. We are dealing with problems which is of the order of uh, sometimes one billion of environments. 100 knots for me is not something impossible. The sky is the limit. It's my life. I never think about anything else. When you get rid of the rules, you can incorporate anything you want. And doing what you dream to do, it's your turn to step up to the plate. There's always going to be a place for sailboats. From man's earliest beginnings, he was fascinated by the world that surrounded him. When he learned to walk, he yearned to run. And when he had mastered the land around him, he looked to the water to explore new horizons. For over 5,000 years, he relied on his own strength to power himself across the waves. Like the Wampanoag tribe from the northeastern United States, he first took a tree, shaping it with fire and simple tools, to create a boat that could carry him across the lakes, the rivers, and the seas that made up his world. To hunt, to trade, and to defend his homeland from invaders. But man's strength would always be limited by the forces of nature. He hungered to go further and faster on the water, and the answer lay in the air, or rather the power of the wind. By adding a sail to his boat, man could harness the forces of nature rather than just his own muscle power, using the wind to propel him forward. The forces on the sail come from the pressure of the wind and also the lift generated by the differing pressures on either side of the sail, giving motion to the boat. But this motion tends to push the boat sideways, not forwards. However, the addition of a weighted keel and a rudder, as well as the shape of the hull, counter this motion in the opposite direction. And when all these forces are combined, the resultant force moves the boat forward. The theory of how a boat sails may seem simple enough, but to make a boat operate as efficiently as possible requires a far deeper understanding. At Europe's number one center for excellence in engineering and technology, Switzerland's École Polytechnique Fédérale de Lausanne, or EPFL, they have been exploring some of science's greatest mysteries for over 150 years. At the heart of EPFL, is the Rolex Learning Center, a library containing one of the largest collections of scientific works in Europe, and big enough to accommodate nearly 2,000 people in a space where the latest ideas can be studied, researched, and debated by some of the brightest minds in the world. In the world of sailing, the America's Cup, sport's oldest competitive trophy, is as far removed from man's early attempts at boat building as the flight of Icarus is from the space shuttle. EPFL has worked closely with the Swiss team Alinghi, helping them to two America's Cup victories and also developing their revolutionary catamaran for the last competition. It's a constant search for the most efficient shape through both the water and the air to decide which design offers the path of least resistance. 
to improve aerodynamics, you have to improve your knowledge of the physical behavior of your boat under specific flow conditions. Previously, towing tanks and wind tunnels were used to test each new version of the evolving boat design. But today, a virtual world of seemingly endless variation has been created to simulate every imaginable effect of wind and wave on every part of a boat's design. For every second of physical time, you may need to solve 10,000 times this type of interaction. That explains why you need a big computer, hopefully a supercomputer, to make all this computation available in a reasonable time. EPFL has one of the world's fastest and most advanced supercomputer systems, capable of over 22 trillion calculations a second. This colossal computing power has been primarily devoted to mapping the human brain, but it also provides the mathematical muscle needed for the complex equations that simulating flow requires. But just as technology allows us a closer understanding of the effect air and water have on a boat, so the complexity of the equations increase. We can dream that uh, one day we will have uh, the perfect algorithm to get the perfect boat, uh, but uh, suddenly afterward uh, you will uh, try to devise new rules and uh, different kind of boat, and then the adventure will start again from scratch. They were really built to sail downwind on a dead run, or on a broad reach, they would handle beautifully, and they were able to sort of navigate their way around the world by following the prevailing winds. Like the America's Cup yachts of today, the square riggers at the turn of the 19th century were at the forefront of sailing technology. As soon as the apparent wind started to move forward of the beam, there was a noticeable lack of performance. But although these vessels were a quantum leap from man's early crude efforts at sail, there was still much to learn. East Indiamen, like the Friendship of Salem, were armed merchant vessels, built more for transporting large cargoes around the world than out-and-out -out speed. But evolution was constant. So they certainly were experimenting with hull design, and during this period, it went from the standard East Indiamen design into the clipper ships. You can really say that the way of making the ship faster was by adding sail area and also adding length. If you made the ship bigger, it would go faster. For the clipper ships, speed was everything, whether transporting goods to ensure the best price or carrying passengers faster than their rivals. In 1854, the clipper champion of the seas set a 24-hour speed record of 467 nautical miles. It would be over 150 years before a single-hulled sailing boat would beat it. The job of sailing these boats fast was a tremendous amount of work. And every time you wanted to set that sail or reef it, you were handling a ton of weight. Handling a topsail would take a minimum of eight people. Um, and you were constantly changing your sail plan. It wasn't a life that was easy. increase the speed of a liquid, uh, the pressure drops. And when the pressure drops, you have a creation of bubbles. It's almost like boiling. For those seeking to create the fastest sailing boat, the phenomenon of cavitation is one of their greatest challenges. So this is a problem that we have in any fast uh, flowing liquid. We have to deal with this kind of vaporization of the liquid, and also after we create this, this bubble, this vapor, it will go back to, to, to liquid state. The French multi-hull Hydropter was designed to be the fastest sailing vessel in the world. In 2009, it set a new mark of 51.36 knots, or nearly 60 miles per hour. EPFL is the project's scientific advisor, working on structures, composites, and trying to minimize the effect of its greatest hydrodynamic challenge. When it comes to sailing, cavitation is a real problem when you try to get very fast, for example, and break the record speed, like a hydropter is doing. Because when you replace the liquid with vapor, because of this pressure drop, you don't have enough forces to lift your, the boat. And it, then you have also this 
cavities that forms on the foil itself starts oscillating very, very uh, strongly, uh, which makes driving this kind of sailing boat uh, very, very difficult and uh, dangerous. But to accurately study cavitation, you first have to simulate it. And one of the world's fastest cavitation tunnels is at EPFL. The idea here is to produce a very low turbulent flow in the upstream, and then we can play with conditions like the incidence angle. And as soon as you put the incidence angle to, to a foil, you will accelerate the foil on the suction side, and there's, there is where the cavitation may occur. So if you play with the pressure, you can obtain the cavitation exactly the one you would see in a real turbine or in a real boat. But research is beginning to show that at high speeds, cavitation, if managed, may not actually slow boats down, but could even help them to go faster still. If you have cavitation between the, the boat and, and the liquid itself, you will have much less drag. If you put micro bubbles near the boat itself, you will decrease the, the drag forces and you can go faster. When we will be able to live with this cavitation, it's going to be possible to, uh, to fly over the water by having this cavitation between the liquid and, and, and the boat itself, and the uh, sky is the limit. So 100 knots for me is not something impossible. <laughs>